Dr. Gavin Ashenden is our guest right now. He writes for the Catholic Herald and uh, is a former Anglican bishop. Good morning to you, Dr. Ashenden. Good morning. Very grateful for your time. Thank you for, uh, for being on. There are a few stories I would love to chat with you about. Number one is this uh, story coming out that says British Parliament passes law banning prayers outside abortion centers. I've personally interviewed Isabel Von Spruce. I've also interviewed Father Sean Guff on this topic. And it seems to be an ongoing issue that's just getting worse there in spite of all the publicity that came out of those two stories. Isabel Von Spruce was arrested again. What is going on in the UK, Dr. Ashenden? It's not very often that I'm lost for words. Um, and, and I originally trained as a lawyer before I became an Anglican priest. But I'm finding that what's happening in the UK almost beyond description. Uh, it's inconceivable to me that our, that our parliament should pass a law banning, banning freedom of movement and, and criminalizing prayer. But that's what it's done. And in a debate yesterday, an amendment was brought to specifically uh, remove prayer from being a criminal offence, but it fails. Wow. Uh, and so we have the situation where our legislators have given police the right to stop somebody in these buffer zones around the clinics, whether the clinics are open or closed. As you know, Isabel was arrested for standing on the street, on, on the sidewalk and praying when the clinic was closed, uh, for giving the police the right to arrest people for praying and asking them what they're doing. If you say, I'm praying, they can take you to prison. It's it's literally beyond words. You know, what gets me about the story almost every time we talk about it is the fact that these abortion centers are closed when they're making this. It's, they're not even open. There's no one, literally no one affected by their internal prayer in their head. And still they insist on pushing this to its uh, to the point where people are being arrested. Is this just the abortion lobby at play here? Does the abortion lobby have such a grip around uh, Parliament that they can they can take this to this level? It's extremely hard to know what it is. You would have thought that in our culture, freedom of speech and freedom of the individual, even the whole mantra pro-choice, which ought to allow you to choose to pray as well as choose to terminate your, your pregnancy, would have some effect. I, I, I think it's the accumulation of years, decades of propaganda from feminism uh, saying that absolutely nothing must interfere with a mother's right to destroy her child. Um, so it doesn't matter it doesn't matter what you say, what the cost is democratically, this single principle has so grasped people's minds that they're unwilling to to, to negotiate on it. I'm willing to understand the implications. One of the MPs said, look, it may be prayer today that we're giving the police uh, power to examine your thoughts over. Tomorrow it may be a political opinion once you've crossed this boundary. There really is nothing at all to stop us moving in to a totalitarian state where the police have powers to arrest you for what they think you're thinking. And yet still Parliament passed it. Uh, it, it might be the power of the abortion lobby. It might be uh, the power of feminism, or it may be the fact that we're moving into a into a, a, a period when people are only capable of having one thought at a time in their head and don't understand the value of freedom of choice and freedom of conscience. When I interviewed Father Sean Guff about his uh, being charged with four counts, one of the points that he brought up that I found very troubling was in his police interview, they were questioning him about things like theology, like what does the Catholic Church teach about grace? Uh, the, his cassock was a symbol of hate. And the, the fact that they were having theological conversation, not conversation based on the law, uh, you know, this is the law which you broke and therefore you're guilty. No, no, no. They were debating what the church teaches that is a that is a deeper more troubling reality that it seems that at least some actors within the government there truly do oppose truth itself wouldn't you say dr ashenden well many of us have said that our battle against wokery and against this new left what we've called cultural marxism is partly inspired by our concern that this new cultural Marxism would begin to behave like the old economic 
and Marxism. And that one of the things it would do ideologically, spiritually, if you like, metaphysically, would be to attack Christianity as one of its seeing, uh, identified one of its prime enemies. And that's actually what we're seeing. The only explanation for that antipathy to a Catholic, to, to theological discussion with a, with a believing Christian, must be that there's something, something ideological and spiritual behind this. And that therefore, we're moving very quickly to a period where the state, uh, as it moves further left, sees Christianity, Christian conscience, Christian integrity as one of its prime opponents. It's hard to think of, 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 of any other explanation for why Catholicism in particular is so profoundly offensive to these new ambitions and powers the state has taken upon itself. So what, what, what are your hopes for the future of your country, Dr. Ashington? I, I think fondly of, you know, the missions and the missionaries who gave their lives, the so many priests, some of which never even made it much further than the boat right back from mainland Europe in hopes of converting back the country that they were born and raised in. Uh, is it possible to see a reconquista of the UK? Is it possible to see a conversion and society changed uh, and turned around? Or is it too late? One of the reasons I became a Catholic is because I've always been entranced the way in which the Catholic faith converted Europe from paganism. It took several hundred years to do it and a great deal of martyrdom and faith. One of my heroes is, is St. Martin de Tours, uh, who's, who... Um, it, after whom the chapel, his capella, his clerk, uh, is named. So, of course, we can turn this round. I don't think we're going to turn it round soon, not in my lifetime. I think we're losing the battle at the moment. And that ought to be a very serious wake-up call to the church. But what is required is, is a greater courage, a greater willingness to articulate our love of Christ and his vision of the kingdom and the transformation of people. So I think we're going to lose rather badly in Europe. Uh, I, I think America is also uh, on the cusp of losing if it's not very careful. Uh, in the end, of course, the kingdom will triumph. One of the things we're seeing is, is Christianity rampant in Africa, more rampant in China, even rampant in Russia. It's just Europe and the liberal secular West, which is giving way to this new form of egalitarian utopianism, which has a hatred of Christianity. We may lose in the short term. Of course, we're going to win in the long term. Let me change subjects. Uh, you wrote an article over at the Catholic Herald, Jordan Peterson's Twitter spat with Pope Francis. Uh, very, very interesting story here that got a lot of uh, attraction on Twitter for in particular. I mean, Jordan Peterson, not necessarily the guy who uh, we would say is uh, uh, that comes to the, the rescue of the Catholic faith. And yet these are the bizarre times we live in. Tell us the backstory. So the Pope has a Twitter account. I think he has 13 million followers and Jordan Peterson has three. And the, the, the Pope's Twitter account tweets, um, you know, pious stuff from time to time. But uh, there was one tweet the other day in hashtag social justice, and it sounded like a bit of the Communist Manifesto. Uh, let's fight for labor rights, uh, fight for immigration, fight for equality. There was nothing Christian or spiritual in it. And Peterson simply pointed this out and said this, this is politics, it's not Christianity. Um, and, and this seemed to me to be such an important point. Uh, one of the, the effects that Peterson has had is he's been doing the church's job for it. Uh, the church of long ago, I should have noticed that we are suffering threats to freedom of speech. Um, and, and the reason this matters to us is, first of all, it offends the dignity of the human person and, and the dignity of conscience, both of which Catholicism ought to be defending up to the hilt in the public square. Our bishops, our theologians, our commentators are not doing it. Uh, it's taken Peterson to do it, and therefore he ought to have our support, our admiration, and our respect. But much more importantly than that, he's done what I've just been suggesting might, he's, he's defended, or rather he's identified the conflict that we've just been talking about. And that is that the new left are trying to close down freedom of speech uh, and uh, and bringing in hate crime, and so his reminder to the Pope that actually he's what he's doing is tweeting support of a political and secular movement without any reference to the soul, to salvation, to the values of the Church, without any reference to the fact that that four or five popes in the last hundred years have given very severe warning about the opposing values of uh, of socialism. So. 
so Peterson is is defending us from a, from papal error, uh, and I mean the Catechism gives gives baptized Christians every right to do that, uh, and I'm, what I'm hoping is that people will get on board and recognise that the one thing Peterson is good at, which is analysis, uh, is is to be supported, and that he's right in doing this. Um, and unfortunately, our hierarchy and and even our Pope have been taken in by by political values and are defending a system that will turn on the church. That's the problem. It's not It's not that no one believes there's no overlap between social justice and the Catholic Church and the gospel. Of course, there's plenty of overlap, but we have to do it in our own terms with an anthropology that is essentially Christian, um, with the hope of, 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 of bringing people a greater freedom and a greater dignity, which socialism does not do. We, we, we can see from behind the iron curtain and the bamboo curtain exactly what it leads to. And uh, all credit to Peterson for standing up in public and saying you have to make a distinction between politics and piety, between the ambitions of socialism, which are totalitarian ultimately, uh, and the ambitions of the, of the Christian Catholic Church for people. So yes, um, I'm pleased to say that as I tried to, to, to put this into an article to explain why it was important, it's, uh, uh, it's been taken up and, and, and is, is being read widely. Now, Jordan Peterson seems to be playing with the fire of Catholicism in the sense that he's right, he's dancing around the edges. Do you think he'll ever become a Catholic? Well, um, I was Jordan Peterson to the extent that I was a psych professor. And when he wrote his first book, Maps of Meaning, I went, oh, my goodness, that's the book I should have written. Obviously, not as well or as effectively as him. Um, but he's a Jungian. And the reason I bring myself into it, I, I went through a period where I was profoundly attracted to Jung for some good reasons. Um, but, but ultimately, Jung is not Jesus, Jungianism is not Christianity, psychology is not faith. Uh, and as you say, he's been deeply attracted, he's giving lectures on the Bible, which show he has a very profound grasp of theology, and, and of the psychological uh, um, authenticity of what so much faith represents. So he too is a fellow traveller, however, to be a Christian, you have to be converted. You have to allow the Holy Spirit to pierce your soul and to want to turn round. That hasn't happened to him yet, but we're praying and hoping it'll happen soon.